Tenia. Good morning, Tenia. How are you? Good morning. Good to morning, see you again. Ray. Thank you. <laughs> Great to have you in the studio for yeah. once. I know, pleasure. right? Exactly. The next step is to actually just get rid of the Yeah, mask. right. <laughs> anyway, but that's another matter. So what is your foundation or your organization doing in celebrating World Ocean Day? It must be a very special day for you. Yeah, we really support uh, this year's theme, which mm. is ocean revitalization as a goal. Mm. But we need to do collective action right. to achieve that. Mm. So uh, with that theme, we do a lot of uh, educations and campaigns through through online, social media, and then also through offline, where we keep educating more and more youth and then also community that live surrounded the uh, ocean, yes. such as islands, and then also villages nearby the rivers, to make sure that they can actually support the ocean from their own home. Right. And also, like, um, actually this just Sunday, um, uh, last Sunday, we did a cleanup activity on one of the islands in the uh, northern part of Jakarta, in Rambut Island, right. where we uh, make sure that, that uh, it is like a conservation island where nobody lives there. Wow. But the trash is this part of the lot. Thousand Islands? Part of the Thousand yeah. Islands, yes. And every day the rangers of the, uh, of the conservation park really needs to clean up um, the waste, which actually came from all of the cities around. Of I've heard that too. I've heard that there's because there's so many islands around Indonesia. I've heard that you can go to like an uninhabited island that is so beautiful and no humans have been there yet, yeah. but there's already trash there and oh, there's plastic no. on the beaches that's so and that's sad. pretty sad. And I've got some alarming numbers for you as Indonesia was placed third as the biggest country that produced marine waste last year while India led the pack, uh, followed by China in second. And in 2020 alone, Indonesia produced over 56 million kilograms of plastic waste in the sea. So as a founder of an NGO whose goal is to eliminate marine waste by 2030, how feasible is that? Because that is a huge task to undertake. Mm. And what is the best approach to this problem? Yeah, I think the best way to eliminate marine waste is actually to stop it from source. Yeah. Uh, firstly, to make sure that we reduce the amount of single-use plastics or everything that cannot be recycled to be produced in the first place. Uh, to make sure that there are some alternative options such as refill stations, mm. reusable packagings, and etc. That we need policies and then also a lot of actions from private sectors for us as uh, consumers, as citizens, right? right? And then the second of all is actually to make sure every, uh, every people, every stakeholders can separate their waste because actually if waste is being separated after being reduced, of course, it can be recycled into right. new materials, into the economic of circular economy, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if we make sure that, and then we also make sure every place um, can be collected for their waste, um, actually, there will be no more, you know, waste leakage to the oceans. Mm. That's correct. Now, this is very interesting because I have uh, heard about separating our waste for a long, long time. I used to belong to uh, this movement called the Clean Up Jakarta Day, and that's where I learned, oh, you need to separate your waste between the one that is recyclable and non-recyclable. And even until now, we're still talking about it. And it seems to me yeah. that there hasn't been an integrated system to make sure that that very good daily habit is implemented in a larger scale and in a, in a, more, uniform, in a more uniform way. So what should happen to make sure that Let's do this, guys. Yeah. Everyone, not just yeah. like patches of people here and patches yeah. of people there. Everyone needs to do it. Like when the government did this no plastic policy in supermarkets. Right, right. Yeah. You know? Like make it easier think? for those who want to recycle. Like have yeah. somebody pick up the recycling. Yeah. That's what we used to do back in Toronto. You would have to split up all of the garbage and your recyclables and different trucks will come in to pick it up. But yes. everybody in the city, everybody across the country was doing the same thing. Because yes. it's just a uniform thing, like you said. Yes. Yeah, I think if we only depends on... Uh, you know, the change of behavior of, mm. of certain peoples or community, it must be taken um, a lot of time, right? Yes. So we need the change of policies and then also radical changes such as investment of recycling facilities. Yes. Because if we already separate their waste, yeah. but in several cities they don't have the recycling technologies, yes. uh, it will be, you know, uh, nothing to be made of right. out of those ways. How, so, how accessible is the recycling technology that um, we have now in Jakarta at least? In Jakarta actually it's already uh, pretty advanced because uh. now we can actually recycle 
mostly everything, even um, you know, um, uh, plastics into oils or even plastic into plastics. Yeah. Uh, we found lots of like now plastic bottles that made out of 100% recycled plastics. Yeah, yeah and then um, I mean like for mainly all of the waste that we produce on households activity, it can be recycled. But for our uh, people in you know eastern part of Indonesia, yes. they do need to transport the waste to Java island to be recycled and it takes a lot of um, money funding right. to transport it right yeah. therefore the policies and then also the innovations that we need on those area that is not yet equipped with uh, um, the technology yeah. is really something that we need to make it fast forward is it expensive the technology and also I assume that you would have to train people as well to be able to use the technology. Mm -hmm. yeah, actually, sometimes it's not that expensive because we only need it to be, you know, uh, make it more dense and then sometimes we need to shed it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if we want to make it, uh, you know, a new plastic pellets, it might be need a whole new industry there, yeah, right? right? Therefore, actually, the government uh, already take a huge steps in terms of making sure that every local government have the knowledge, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's not fast enough. Uh, mm -hmm. That needs NGOs and then also youth um, and you know, you know environmentalists to help to educate them to make it faster. And even if the funding from the government is not there yet this year, we can get it from grants and private sectors. Can can policies help with? I'll tell you my experience because um, you know we a lot of us the people that I know are already separating plastics and you know uh, folding up card i have guy a guy that comes up and pick up all of my cardboard stuff for, and he brings it to recycle right. i think he gets a little bit of money for it yeah. but i feel like i'm in the minority i feel like mm. a lot of the roadside vendors for example that we go to you know when you order some food or some breakfast it yeah. still comes with those plastics and a lot or of that styrofoams. i believe has to do with yeah styrofoam yeah. and i believe a lot of that has to do with price as well because yes. i'm sure they have a very small profit margin yeah. and they're trying to make whatever money they can so this is on a much larger scale, plastic is still such a huge problem. And how can government policy change that? Because it's such a difficult thing to tackle because it's just every, it's still everywhere from what I see. And I mean, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, I can just see people still carrying around those little plastics, you know, the black and white striped ones or the little black ones, they're still everywhere. Yeah, I think um, there's so many uh, collective actions that we need mm -hmm. to make sure that we need to stop those single-use plastics right. that we found um, on ground. Uh, but we can do it uh, parallelly. Okay. So by parallelly, I meant that from the local and grassroots levels, we can educate more and more people because uh, in Diverse Blend Action, we do have a program called FINLA in Jakarta area right. where we uh, really educate the moms, local moms okay. in nice. you know, a rural area in the, nearby the rivers yes. for them to understand that there are actually values in plastics mm. um, if they can separate it. But not every plastic needs to be produced, so they need to reduce it. Okay. And if, if they want to reduce it, they actually have alternative options such as refill stations right. that actually cheaper for them yes. so the understanding on it and then also the the accessibility of the alternative solution is something that is important mm -hmm. but the other hand Indonesia as uh, developing countries mm -hmm. we really are dependent on developed countries and then also you know big FMCG brands mm -hmm. that actually located outside in Indonesia mm -hmm. therefore I think strong advocacy uh, in terms of international policies yeah. um, and then also treaties and stuff like that is really important and I think NGO activists, um, environmentalists, youth really speak louder on it to make you know radical changes that you know we need to stop virgin plastics, for example. Right. Yeah. We need to make recycled plastic cheaper rather than virgin plastic. Yes. Yeah. Things right. like that. And I'll, I'll have a little tip as well. If you do want to visit one of those you know, food vendors, you want to get some bubur ayam in the morning, bring your own Tupperware. That's correct. Right? That's just give it to them and then you just bring it back and you have no waste at all. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Or the sometimes they use paper, right? Yes. It's like, uh, like the old Indonesian, you know, like wrapping. Typical, yeah. Paper, paper right. uh, food paper. Right. So you, also, you mentioned about, uh, you know, like having meetings and stuff. Uh, you know, activist, environmental activists gathering and thinking about things, uh, solutions to actually uh, preserve the health of our environment and in your case, the health of our ocean. So you recently um, attended the Ocean Conference in Palau. Yes. Uh, what was the result of that conference? Yeah, I think sometimes if we go to like different conferences and summits, mm -hmm. we, we tend to feel like fed up, you know? It's already yes. like 2022. And so you feel like, that too? I feel that oh, as well. I thought it's just only us yeah. for looking from the outside. Because sometimes, this is only my personal opinion, of course, you can absolutely disagree with me. Um, when I see big conferences like COP, you know, it's like I've been 
following like on and off COP from COP21 in Paris and then COP26 uh, recently in Scotland or something, somewhere, somewhere in Great Britain. And I feel like you guys just keep talking about the same thing, discussing yeah. about the same thing, coming up with the same solutions. How come we haven't seen any, any major changes from the big corporations? Like, what are you guys doing exactly? And just like what Greta Thunberg said when she made that statement, it's like, you guys are just blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, but you, as someone who's in, on, in, in the, you know, inside this whole thing, how do you see it? Yeah, um, just like what I say, sometimes I feel that way as well, mm. so I really agree with you. Uh, but uh, in some way that uh, the Our Ocean Conference that you mentioned earlier have a different characteristic of conference mm. because they are more into uh, commitments and also a tangible real actions that mm. can be reported every year mm. by state Act, uh, government uh, and also non-state actors mm. such as private sectors, communities, and then also uh, CSOs. Um, and with that uh, characteristic, actually on those conferences, we really divided ocean issues with specific um, actions right. and tangible, you know, steps that such need to be done. Such for as, example, for example, example. On, 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 on marine plastics, mm. uh, we need to make sure that how we can change the price of the recycled plastic or the virgin plastics, right? Mm. So they really uh, elaborate and incorporated youth in the panels mm -hmm. to really, you know, um, highlights all of the gaps that we found and we can actually pointing out like, hey, your country, hey, your private sector, stuff mm -hmm. like that. So mm -hmm. by um, the end of the conferences, we have these, you know, steps that we can follow and next year we can actually ask them because they always come um, every year for the mm -hmm. oceans. So I think that's really um, important and also what I learned is they really highlighted the indigenous knowledge. Um, on, on the conference. Such Indigenous as? knowledge is such as, for example, on sustainable fisheries, mm. we do have this sassy culture in Indonesia. Mm. But in Palau, they do have bull um, culture, where actually the community of fishermen will not take fishes on, uh, on certain months. Right. Because it will conserve the fish stocks. Right. Yeah. Stuff like that. And before this year, before these conferences, actually local indigenous knowledge feels like a tokenistic thing. Mm. to be discussed. Right. But on, the, on these conferences, they really think about how we can actually make the local wisdom to be the most front knowledge Lovely. that we need to be um, as a reference right. for our policies. Right. So yeah, I'm really, really um, happy to be a part of that. Mm. And I hope that more and more youth mm. can be participate on that because sometimes youth can breach the gap within those blah, blah, blah moments. And then also like, okay, what's the changes? You know, right, right. things Where like that. Going? Well, uh, speaking about changes, and you did mention policies, uh, back in 2018, the Minister for Maritime Affairs here in Indonesia uh, said that the Indonesian government should be able to take action for those who litter into the sea. Mm. Uh, where does that stand now? And is that something that's possible? How would the enforcement be? Yeah, I think um, Indonesia already has a strong national policy, okay. mm. but the challenges is how it is being implemented. Mm. Yes. Right? Because Indonesia is huge countries. We right. do have 17,000 more islands, right? How we can monitor it. And I think collective actions with uh, this year's uh, Ocean Day theme, uh, we cannot only, you know, uh, make the government can monitor everything, yes. right? We need the citizens, the youth, the, the communities that live on the area have the ability to report it and then also to know what to do if they found it. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that is lacking now, okay. but I see lots of differences and changes uh, because in Indonesia, we do also have this kind of task forces mm -hmm. named National Plastic Action Partnerships, okay. where we actually have different task forces for metrics, for data, for behavior change, for funding, for stuff like that. And we see more and more changes in these local um, local cities mm. uh, to implement changes. Yeah, it's because the law can only exist. I mean, it's up to people to enforce these laws Absolutely. as well. Yeah, and also, yeah. it's not only coming from Indonesia, right? right? It's also coming from all over the country. Yeah, that's because true. Because ocean right. is one. <laughs> ocean actually joins us all together, right? We exactly. Right. So, uh, I do notice that some FMCGs uh, have tried to use, uh, you know, recyclable plastic because of the demand, there is this demand, especially for the, from the young generation to change. Yeah. Otherwise, we're not yeah. gonna live on this earth. It's like, it's not fair because you've lived, but I haven't, yeah. right? That's the position. Yeah. But what about these um, 
you know, there's this boom of e-commerce now in yes. Indonesia, which is a great thing for the economy, but at the same time, there's a waste problem. Yeah. It's like I am guilty as charged because oh, yeah. I use that, uh, you know, like the the it's delivery so from the, right? yes. it is super convenient, right. but I feel bad every time I buy a product, the bubble wraps. Oh my God, the, tape the boxes goes are okay, the packaging, yeah. but the bubble wraps, I, I'm just conflicted. How do we advocate? I mean, it's like, how do we deal with, with um, e-commerce now? And the thing is that, the thing about e-commerce is that they are pretty much mom and pop shop, yeah. right. but yeah. online. Yeah. So how do you make sure that e-commerce um, or, or the, sh the, the sellers in e-commerce is not contributing to the waste problem in yeah. Indonesia? Yeah, I think um, to change that, and then also I'm, uh, I'm a consumer, of yes. course, of these delivery um, expeditions or like services. Um, on the past four years, Diverse Clean Action joined with other collaborators, uh, now already more than 100 collaborators in Indonesia. We helped this Pawai Bebas Plastic Movement, mm. where it translated into Free Single Use Plastic March, right. where we actually marching on streets um, during the pandemic situations mm -hmm. and on the pandemic situations we do it online where we collect um, you know allies in communities mm -hmm. to actually realize them in terms of we are consumers and we do have the rights to ask for alternative solutions we also do have the rights to make them change because we want to buy other things rather than single-use plastic packaging yeah. And with that march, we, uh, we also uh, demand the government to have the policies to support the reusable packaging, uh, refillable packaging, and then also fasten uh, the policy that, you know, we cannot wait until 2050 or 2030 exactly. for the FMCG to change their, you know, packaging. Exactly. Um, and we need it now, right? Yeah. Uh, and we need these strong allies of communities to speak out loud, and we also, with this community, we already documented up until now, of course, with our collaborators, collaborators that already more than 40 or 50 cities now implemented the single-use plastic uh, bags free march, uh, sorry, policy. Yeah. And we need more than single-use plastic bags yeah. that is being banned. Yeah. We need straws, we need styrofoams, we need yeah. sachets, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, sachets, yeah. I never even thought of that. Yeah, true. There's so yeah. many of them. Yeah. You get a whole bunch every time you want to order some food and half yeah. the time you're not even using them. Or even know. sometimes like shampoos and stuff. Yeah. It's, it's usually, it, 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 it has something to do with the mindset, right? Yeah. Oftentimes outside Jakarta at least, uh, especially in the, in the other islands of right. Indonesia, there's this habit of the... Uh, the the local uh, community to use sa shampoo oh, and sachets instead thing. or soap in, in sachets instead oh. uh, that creates a lot of waste yes. sometimes it's not only because of the convenience but yeah. also because it's cheaper yeah. exactly therefore right. we there get the policy and then also the innovations to make them actually it is uh, you know uh, you don't you do not need to buy like huge bottles sure. because it's yeah. Obviously expensive, right? Yeah. Uh, but we can give them the alternative solutions of refillable. Exactly. Like right. You know what? Well, speaking of refillable, I wish, I don't know if Governor Anis Baswedan hears this or not, <laughs> <laughs> restaurants should have refillable water, you know? Yes. Instead of bottled. Yeah. That's what I've Actually, a few wanted. restaurants already do. I'm quite familiar with several really? restaurants that I frequent. Um, but make a, it make it like a, a plastic glass uh, or, yeah. or regular glass and yeah. they refill it. And yeah, it's or just a glass glass, right? Because, yeah. you know, it's like rather than ordering, yeah. yes, I would like a, a glass of mineral water, you know, right. instead of getting a bottle, why not just get a refillable sure. where you use a glass glass with... You know, like the... Especially those little ones. Sometimes you order and you get these little ones. I so you, know. <laughs> you're drinking, you can drink like three of them even That's just through I'm a saying. meal. And uh, I guess accessibility is one. We mentioned price a lot, but accessibility yeah. is another thing. Like yeah. I, I'm sure everyone would love to use recycled plastics, but are mm. they that easy to find yes. right now? Not so much, unfortunately. Mm. Now, um, this past weekend, Formula E held its very first race here in Jakarta. <laughs> one of the racers is a, an ocean enthusiast, is a surfer as well. You had a chat with them. Can you tell yeah. us about that conversation? What did you guys talk about? Yeah, I got the privilege to chat on uh, with some of the racers, mm -hmm. and one of them uh, named Antonio, uh, and he actually surfed in Bali before the race. Mm 
mm. and we did talk a lot about how uh, because he grew up um, in Portugal he learned uh, to do surfing right and he loved the oceans mm. and when he he do surfing uh, in Portugal or Indonesia he saw trash mm. and we did talk uh, a lot about how actually Formula E as one of the you know big platform mm. even though maybe it's not that big enough now right but People coming there because they are race enthusiasts. They are not environmental, right? Right. Uh, and himself said that before Formula E, he was just a racer. But because of Formula E, he learned and learned more about how electricity can actually save the environment, the climate change, mm -hmm. and then also actually he can utilize the platform to educate more people that didn't care before. Sure can become care and act more after that. So I think that is such an inspiration uh, moment for me, inspirational moment. And I think we need to make those kind of activities to be implemented not only on Formula E, but all of uh, various platforms mm -hmm. and big events such as G20 or other uh, yes. events that maybe not actually related to environment, yes. yeah. but it can change the mindsets of people because the lifestyle is actually really easy to be implemented yeah. if it is being organized. Right. Very yeah. cool because Formula E in it itself is already based on the reason there's Formula E is because they want to reduce the amount of fuel being used just for yeah. racing cars around a track. Yeah. And that's done just that. But actually what it's done in addition to that is just to make people more aware mm -hmm. of our environment as well. So that's a good thing. Glad you got to, uh, get to touch base with them and hope that yeah. future races do take place so you guys are able to collaborate on future projects together as well. Yeah, I hope so because the Formula E has these uh, yearly um, awards named Green Together okay. where they seek for local champions like myself, well, uh, that's why I was invited in yeah. the first place. And I hope like next years there will be more and more local champions and people actually really keen to do more for the environment because yeah. they want to watch Formula E. Yeah, yeah. why not? Why not, why not right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So you mentioned about activities and also, uh, you know, it's like sharing the education um, uh, around these things, you know, for the uh, sustainability of our environment. So what are the activities that you've lined up uh, this year from your foundation uh, that is related to uh, educating more and more people to be more aware of this issue and thus we can take care of our oceans together instead of just like, you know, environmental activists and NGOs. Because, yeah. you know, it's, it's a big job to do. I think we all need to, to, to take part in this big job with you, right? Yeah, um, one of the programs that we have on this year, which actually already been implemented since uh, uh, several years ago, is actually Marine Debris Rangers program, where we actually give equal access, just like what you mentioned earlier, to more youth on several cities. Uh, we give grants to them, we give capacity buildings for them to really actually make the change on their own local area, whether it's a village or cities to make them um, you know, um, have the grants and knowledge to really implement things. Because sometimes we, we, you know, we, we make them feel like they are wrong because they are the consumers. But actually, youth can uh, ignite more changes in the community by giving them that uh, resources. They can uh, make the programs, they can advocate the local government, and now we already have 15 villages that is being um, um, uh, you know, developed with these local rangers. Um, and we collaborate with private sectors, of course, to fund this. And then we are looking for more uh, villages to be developed. And of course, with this, I hope that um, the youth can take part on making the change faster. One more question. Um, First. You've been doing this for years now, you know, since 2015, it's been seven years. Have you ever experienced a corporation trying to greenwash themselves by approaching you? Of course. You? And how did you deal with that? Um, I think um, as the youth-led NGO, one of our uh, plus side is actually we can say whatever we want. <laughs> without, the answer to no one. <laughs> yeah, without somebody is, um, you know, getting mad at us. Right. So uh, we usually just say that, okay, if we collaborate, then what you are going to change in your own business models. Yeah. And usually what we offer to them is, okay, we can actually help you. To, to do the research on your own companies, to actually change your habits, whether it's on the process system or even on their daily day-to-day -day office life. Mm. 
uh, such as reduction and then recycle and then we can give them the reference of policies that you can uh, explore as well, things like that. So I think um, that's what we can do to make sure that these uh, private sectors, uh, which already have the, you know, willing to do something, to do something that is much more effective rather than just, you know, campaigning on online social media. Yeah, like PR. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> DC is uh, continuing to do great things and I do know you yourself uh, do plenty in your beach cleanups. You're very hands-on yourself, you and your groups, your rangers as you call them. So we do wish you all the best Thank in you. your efforts. And we obviously will always try to do our part. I always feel like we're not doing enough. And every no. time we have these conversations, it reminds me of how much more we can be doing yeah. as well. Well, so we hope that we were able to inspire you to do the same as we celebrate World Ocean Day here on June the 8th. Thank you, Tanya, for joining us. Thank you. And good luck to you in your efforts in the future. Thank you so much. And we're going to take a little break. When we come back, we still have lots more for you. Thank you, Tanya. That was so fun. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken,